Okay, um, so we'll, we'll go over the history and story. Um, here's uh, some uh, background first. Uh, that's what I'm gonna talk about, uh, how it all started. And it all started actually when we started looking at whether we can decrease total protein in the diets. Um, for different reasons, I'll, I'll mention this later. Then I'll talk about history and what, what is it. Uh, some of the research that was done earlier, and then uh, our studies at Penn State. This, this all started in Idaho. Uh, when I was in Idaho, the United Dairy Men of Idaho actually were interested about reducing ammonia emissions. That's how this low protein work uh, started. Uh, and it is here, um, uh, livestock uh, are a major uh, source of ammonia emissions and that, that was their concern uh, with the dairy industry in the southern part of the state. Reduced feed cost, of course, that's a, that's a factor there. Every time you uh, decrease protein in the diet, you will have uh, decreased feed cost most of the time and um, hopefully uh, improved income over feed cost. Um, I have a final note here about uh, reproduction, and uh, we are not going to talk at all about this, but there are some data showing that um, overfeeding protein also can be related to uh, reproductive problems. So the environmental concern is, is obvious there. Uh, more nitrogen in the environment causes um, eutrophication in water bodies. We are in the Northeast, and uh, this couple of pictures here show uh, Lake Erie and the Chesapeake Bay. So in, in that area there, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediments are uh, a key uh, when, when it goes to uh, water pollution. Uh, as I said, uh, livestock, uh, ruminants, are a major contributor to uh, ammonia. And that was, again, the interest that uh, started all this research with low-protein diets. Um, I mentioned nitrous oxide, and I'm just going to show you here uh, briefly, because that's going to be important as we uh, go forward, uh, I think. Although livestock are really not the major uh, source of nitrous oxide, uh, these are EPA data. Uh, and really, from agriculture, this is the major greenhouse gas. But uh, crop production is the major source, not uh, livestock. And of course, producing uh, feed for the animals is part of that. This is some work from Chang He, actually, uh, his early work at Penn State. And uh, as, as you can see here, every time you decrease uh, protein in the diet, this were 16 versus 14 percent crude protein diet, you will have decreased uh, urinary nitrogen losses. Uh, uh, Mike talked about this, and then you will have uh, decreased ammonia emissions, up to 50%. So 2% units uh, drop in uh, crude protein will uh, decrease ammonia by almost 50%. And not just um, in the barn or from, ammonia, uh, from manure storage. When that manure goes on, on the field and applied to soil, you will still have uh, a large difference in the ammonia emitted, as this uh, here shows, almost twice, actually more than twice, uh, decrease in ammonia emissions when manure was applied on soil. So there is some trend now to talk about uh, methane in, rela in relation to uh, crude protein in the diet. There are some data to confirm that there may be a relationship there. Uh, this is some uh, data from uh, <clears throat> uh, Susanna, uh, the last graduate student who worked on the histidine uh, projects, uh, at least for now. And uh, what we did there, we fed uh, two levels of uh, crude protein, um, metabolizable protein, crude protein, and then uh, different levels of histidine. But uh, what I want to sh show you here, we actually measured methane emissions uh, in this study. And there was a decrease uh, in uh, both cases here. This is methane total emissions and methane yield, which is on a, a dry methane intake basis, when we were feeding these uh, metabolizable protein deficient diets. 
Of course, there was a difference in the starch content in this diet because RUP was replaced by starch. The point is that I think there will be uh, more interest uh, going forward uh, looking at how methane relates to protein in the diet as well. Another study that we just uh, finished here again shows uh, some kind of a similar uh, interesting trend. This was a starch study uh, where we fed up to 40% starch, very unusual obviously diet for dairy cows. And uh, what we saw is actually linear uh, decrease in methane emissions on an energy corrected milk basis. And of course there was a difference here in uh, nitrogen between those diets. So these relationships I think will be important uh, to, to look at um, in the future. When this is again work uh, from uh, Changhi uh, back in time, um, we, we have to be aware, of course, you cannot indefinitely decrease protein in the diet and have no response in uh, milk production or performance of the cows. So in this case, we went from again 40, 16 to 14 percent and we lost uh, three kilos of milk and no difference in dry mat intake. This was about 12 to 13 uh, percent below MP requirements. So what can you do at that point? Of course, we started looking at uh, amino acid supplementation to repair the problem. Uh, or, uh, if it depends on the study, you may not see actually uh, production effects of uh, lower protein diets, but you may see a body uh, weight change effect. And you are not going to see this if you are doing a crossover type of design study. So this is an example uh, from Fabio, another graduate student uh, who worked with the histidine studies. And um, you can see that uh, those cows that were fed the low protein diet uh, had much lower body weight gain. This was a continuous design uh, experiment. All right, let's move to histidine. <coughs> What is, what is histidine and why are we interested in it? What is it? <laughs> it's a very unique, actually, amino acid of uh, all these uh, essential amino acids that uh, uh, we are talking about. Uh, even compared to lysine and methane, it's still a unique amino acid for a number of reasons. It's not just uh, that it has that imidazole uh, side chain, uh, but uh, mostly because... Um, <clears throat> It has body reserves, and I'll talk uh, more about this. Um, uh, Chang-Hee talked about group one, group two amino acids, so this is a group one amino acid, uh, along with methionine. Uh, that has some implications, and I'll show you uh, some data here. Um, uh, so when you look at this, because they are metabolized similarly, and actually their concentration in milk uh, protein is similar as well, so you will think the requirements are the same. But when you look at the data out there, uh, that's not the case. A number of reasons for this, these endogenous uh, histidine depots that I mentioned. And then also uh, there is a difference in between uh, histidine and methionine uh, concentrations in microbial protein. So that's, that's another key um, important uh, feature to keep in mind when you talk about histidine. These are data from Helene uh, Lapierre, uh, that she has done a lot of this kind of work, very important work, that uh, is showing here that past the liver, there is actually um, very little difference between uh, histidine and methionine, and um, in fact, what goes into the mammary gland is almost one-to-one -one secreted in milk, unlike lysine, for example, like. Uh, Chunky showed here. Uh, there has been quite a bit of research uh, done over the years. This is a meta-analysis that uh, was just published uh, with histidine. Again, Chunky mentioned it. But I want to, uh, I'm putting this table here. I'll talk about it later, but I'm putting the table to show you that about 1990s, 99 and so on, there was quite few uh, uh, studies done with histidine. And then there was a gap of maybe I don't know, almost 20 years, until we started that work at uh, Penn State. This work, the original one, was done with grass silage. So there is a, quite a bit of difference there uh, because it was done on Finland, in Finland and um, England, the UK. 
Uh, so it was uh, rapeseed, uh, grass silage type of diets. The more recent studies here, they are typically uh, corn silage studies, uh, and uh, we'll talk about this later. But there is, there is a research done in the past. Um, Balkem uh, recorded one of these uh, journal club uh, discussions with Helen and Susanna, the graduate student, so you can uh, listen to this one here when you have a chance. He is actually where uh, all, it all started. How many of you know who Virtanen is? There is one back there. Huh? Uh, <laughs> that's a really uh, an important scientist, and one of the Nobel, uh, uh, Nobel Prize winners uh, back in time from agriculture, for agricultural research, not related to what I'm going to tell you here. But he actually uh, did studies with dairy cows fed completely on non-protein diets. So he fed, uh, I don't know how many cows, not too many, but for several years, completely on um, the nitrogen source. There were synthetic diets, not just the nitrogen, but the carbohydrates as well. But he, uh, the, the nitrogen source was only urea and uh, ammonium salts. And those cows did just fine because the microbes obviously synthesized all the essential amino acids that the cows needed. The milk production of some of these cows was up to 4,000 kilos a year. But this is the interesting uh, part. He labeled the rumen, so he labeled uh, the microbes, and then uh, took uh, milk casein and separated the amino acids and analyzed uh, enrichment of those amino acids. So here's what he found. This is the normal diet, so normal feeds, and uh, the lowest, the amino acid with the lowest enrichments uh, were methionine and histidine, as you can see here, plus tryptophan, of course. But uh, those are the important ones that we're going to talk about. Cows on synthetic diets look where methionine moved, but histidine still stayed down there. And he was talking about bottleneck uh, for microbial synthesis and milk production casein synthesis in those cows. So based on this work, uh, he concluded that histidine and tryptophan uh, may be an important, important amino acids for uh, uh, milk protein synthesis. That's where the histidine work uh, started in Finland, uh, in the UK, and uh, it's the original work uh, from uh, Virtanen. Uh, so what is the, is there any feats that have higher histidine uh, than, than others. This is uh, um, some data from Evonik. Uh, those are on a trimeter basis, on a ASIS basis, because they, they don't actually work on the absolute trimeter basis. <clears throat> and as you, as you can see, uh, by far, blood meal is the only one that um, really makes a difference here. But there are some others that are relatively higher than uh, some of these other feeds here. For example, whole cotton seed may have a little more histidine. Uh, corn gluten, corn gluten meal, they also will be a little higher uh, on uh, histidine. But no, not a lot of difference between um, grass silage and corn silage, for example. They are back here. Uh, and um, let's say rapeseed meal and soybean meal or canola meal. These are some of the NASM data. I just put them here. Uh, so you can see that uh, canola meal and soybean meal, for example, they are pretty close. Feather meal, we know it's low in histidine. When we were formulating low histidine diets for some of these studies, we always used uh, feather meal because, uh, because of this low histidine content. Feather meal is also extremely variable in quality, and, and you have to be careful where you get it. And, what kind of uh, quality it is. So <clears throat> we were asked uh, back in time, I mean, okay, grass silage, we understand that, but why corn silage or corn silage based diets? There will be sufficient amount of histidine in these diets to worry about histidine deficiency and so on. So we did actually this calculation uh, again back in time and looked at uh, <clears throat> how much histidine goes in a high-producing 
Austin Cow versus this uh, those were a uh, Irish here mostly uh, that uh, the studies that were done in uh, Finland for example back in the 90s so here's uh, how much histidine will go uh, in in one case versus the other so a lot more uh, histidine will be supplied with a normal corn silage based diet uh, and of course these cows eat a lot more than uh, than this one here uh, but at the same time, there will be a lot more histidine secreted in milk uh, by these cows. And when you put these two together, in fact, they are pretty similar. So it's not uh, corn silage or grass silage based diet or rapeseed meal or canola meal versus uh, soybean meal. It's uh, input and output. And um, there, is, there is no surprise that histidine can be uh, uh, deficient amino acid in, in uh, lactating dairy cows, fed corn silage diets. This is all the work that uh, was done at uh, Penn State with histidine. Um, I'm not going to obviously talk about all this. Uh, probably will summarize just a uh, couple of studies. I will show you a couple of studies and then the meta-analysis uh, that uh, Susanna did. Where, uh, why we started this? We actually were feeding these low protein diets trying to reduce ammonia emissions uh, when Chang was there as well. And what we found was that uh, it seems like every time you feed a low protein diet, blood histidine was significantly decreased, quite significantly. I'll show you some of this data. So this triggered uh, our interest in histidine. The hypothesis was, uh, of course, that uh, because microbial protein is low in histidine than methionine, or low in histidine than methionine. And uh, you have uh, <coughs> microbial protein becoming a more and more important source of metabolism of protein for the cow as you feed a low protein diet, so you have less feed RUP versus microbial RUP. And at the same time, it's lower in uh, methionine. Uh, in histidine than methionine, then maybe uh, histidine becomes that first limiting amino acid that we are so interested in. Here are some of the data that uh, these are control diets. They are not uh, amino acid supplemented. Um, lower versus uh, relatively higher uh, protein con crude protein content. Here is 15.6 versus 14, again. 15.7 versus around 14, and so on. In all these cases, we saw a dramatic, quite dramatic, very significant drop in plasma histidine. The interesting thing was that methionine did not change at all. In all these studies that I'm showing you, and pretty much all of our studies, uh, there was no decrease in methionine. Now, the treatment diets we always supplemented with methionine, uh, this, uh, but these are not uh, methionine supplemented data. All right, I mentioned uh, those uh, <clears throat> endogenous sources of histidine, and that's, an, again, a, a one unique feature of histidine. Uh, there is no other amino acid that I am aware of uh, having these uh, body reserves. Uh, the most important one is, I think, hemoglobin. Um, but we all have also these dipeptides, uh, carnosine and anserin, that are in muscles uh, that can provide histidine uh, for a period of time. We have almost never seen anything about uh, anserin, but carnosine, we have seen differences in carnosine concentration in blood or in uh, muscle when we were feeding um, uh, low protein diets. So Fabio calculated uh, you know, what these reserves are roughly. Uh, with blood hemoglobin, you have about 380 grams of metabolism of histidine, as an example. Uh, muscle carnosine and anserin, about 270. And we also estimated that um, these reserves, if you have a histidine deficient diet, uh, will maybe supply histidine for up to six, seven weeks. Okay. And here's the problem when you, you don't have the appropriate design, experimental design, to look at histidine particularly. Uh, these are two studies. One was a crossover uh, Latin square type of uh, experiment with four, three weeks, four weeks uh, uh, periods. 
And the other one was a continuous design. I think it was uh, either 12 or 15, 12 or 13 weeks long study. In this case, um, sorry, this is the changeover design. This is the continuous design. When we were feeding these low protein diets, clear uh, drop in blood histidine in the continuous design over these 10, uh, 12, 13 weeks versus the crossover design where there was no difference, same diets and same animals. Uh, and actually the two uh, experiments were done at the same time. Uh, here's uh, an example with, with hemoglobin and how that uh, can uh, be affected by uh, histidine deficiency. This is a study again by Fabio, uh, uh, normal protein diet, a low protein diet, and then supplemented with um, lysine, lysine and methionine, and all three amino acids. So only in the case where we supplemented histidine, uh, blood hemoglobin went back to the normal uh, diet concentration. Again, clear indication that these cows were using hemoglobin uh, for histidine when the diet was deficient in histidine. Uh, I mentioned this uh, difference in uh, uh, microbial protein between histidine uh, and methionine. So here's some of those data, um, our data from uh, Penn State. Uh, show about 27% uh, low uh, uh, histidine in microbial protein than the methionine. In milk, they seem to be uh, almost the same, or actually our data show a little higher uh, histidine in uh, milk protein than uh, methionine. NRC, uh, the old data, are showing about 18% uh, low uh, histidine than methionine in bacteria. And then these are the nascent data from uh, the publication do I have a source here? I don't have the source, but these are the, uh, the data from NASM, and they are showing about 16% uh, lower histidine than methionine. So across uh, all these uh, studies, obviously, and meta-analysis, it's clear that uh, the microbes will have a lower concentration of histidine than methionine. And again, when you uh, <clears throat> feed a lower protein diet, uh, the, the contribution a microbial protein to, uh, to metabolism of protein will be higher. These are some uh, data from uh, INRA uh, that uh, show this kind of relationship. And I actually put together uh, NASM, some NASM simulations here. And again, you can see that the contribution of uh, microbial uh, protein to, to MP uh, is going to be increasing as you have a low uh, protein diet. So let's go over a couple of our uh, studies here. Uh, this is one uh, that I mentioned where uh, we fed a low histidine diet versus a normal diet. So there was no uh, histidine supplementation here. We had a deficiency, as you can see here, about six or seven grams. Lysine and methionine were fine. Uh, blood histidine dropped again dramatically. This is a continuous long-term study. And then uh, uh, blood carnosine also dropped down. Uh, we saw a decrease in dry mat intake, uh, about two kilos or almost two kilos uh, with a histidine deficient diet. So remember, methionine and lysine were the same. Uh, drop in uh, energy corrected milk. But uh, quite surprisingly, actually, we didn't have an effect on, uh, on uh, milk uh, through protein. What we did, though, we actually had some minimal protected histidine, and at the end of the study, for one or two weeks, I can't remember, we supplemented that rumen protected histidine. And here's what happened with dry mat intake. Even within this one week, dry mat intake increased by 1.4 kilos, and that was a significant effect. When we fed rumen protected histidine to this low histidine diet, after the study, um, <clears throat> blood histidine also significantly increased, blood carnosine also increased, and as you can see here, uh, blood hemoglobin jumped from week uh, 10 to 11, also uh, increased. Uh, I, I can't remember if this was a significant or just a trend, but it did increase. 
Uh, one other study that uh, Susanna did, uh, we, we had a, actually a seri a two, seri a two studies in series. One was a, a low protein uh, diet or metabolism of protein deficient diet versus a metabolism of protein adequate diet. So here the histidine levels here, um, a linear increase in um, histidine supply, digestible histidine supply. Um, we had a, a linear increase here in milk through protein. I actually, the, <laughs> I, I should be looking, looking here. Uh, we increased also uh, uh, milk yield, feed efficiency, but no effect on dry matter intake. Uh, blood histidine, linear increased here. Uh, blood carnosine again, linear increased. The efficiency of histidine, though, efficiency of histidine use decreased linearly, and which makes sense uh, uh, when you are uh, looking at this amino acid supplementation. So, of course, there is a, <clears throat> a balance between uh, economics and how much money you want to spend on amino acids and what is the return in terms of milk prices and feed, feed costs and, and so on. But when we calculated this uh, efficiency of histidine use, uh, that's what, uh, you know, the nascent calculations are basically, uh, we did see a linear decrease. So uh, the nascent target is 75%, uh, I think, or 77. So it will be somewhere here. And even at the highest, so only the highest supplementation brought us uh, close to the uh, target efficiency uh, for histidine in nascent, again, 75%. Um, we did see, uh, again, a, a response in, in both cases. Uh, in the low protein uh, or MP deficient and MP adequate diets in energy corrected milk, but the response was different. You see here a quadratic response versus a linear response in that uh, um, the metabolism of protein deficient diet. Okay, finally I'll finish here with uh, uh, this meta analysis that I mentioned that uh, Susanna did. Uh, these are all the studies that were included. I think there were 20. 22 studies, yeah, about 22 studies for, for the most part. So uh, they, they were both infusions and uh, rumen protected amino acid supplementation. <clears throat> Dry mat intake increased. I think it's about 200 grams per day per cow. Uh, milk production also increased. Energy corrected milk uh, was not increased statistically, but was almost a trend at 0.11 was the p-value, and milk uh, true protein and uh, yield, percent and yield also increased. The thing that actually decreased was milk fat. So we are not quite sure what's going on there. Could be a dilution effect because of the increased milk, but that was the only uh, effect that uh, was for a decrease. Uh, this data here show um, pretty much a plateau after certain uh, supply of digestible histidine. This is called adjusted digestible histidine because of some uh, analytical adjustments that uh, Helen did. But as you can see, about maybe 75 or so grams per day digestible histidine, uh, the response pretty much is uh, flat from that point on. When you, when you separate uh, these uh, uh, infusion studies versus supplementation studies, uh, and then uh, low protein or high protein, MP deficient, MP adequate, you will see that the response is always higher in both cases uh, with uh, the MP deficient diets. So if you feed to a low protein diet, you would expect that the response to histidine supplementation uh, will be higher. And the final graph I'm going to show here is uh, uh, we estimated those uh, efficiencies uh, for histidine, and uh, in terms of uh, uh, this is uh, uh, histidine, digestible histidine uh, supply, uh, we are coming again to approximately this 75, 74 grams digestible histidine, and we also uh, looked at the relationship with energy. I mean, the other speakers here have talked about this. Obviously, energy is, is number one in most cases in dairy, uh, dairy diets. 
What we found is that uh, there is, uh, again, a threshold here, about 1.6 ratio between digestible histidine and uh, energy supply. Uh, below 1.6, uh, you can consider that histidine is limiting. Uh, above 1.6 ratio, uh, the energy will be limiting and you are not gonna get a response uh, to histidine supplementation. This is all in the paper you can see there. Uh, Chang, he showed this, I'm not gonna talk about this, but really um, um, there is a lot of, uh, uh, there is a lot of false data if you want. I, I don't wanna use that word, but uh, uh, mis miscalculated bio, uh, availability of amino acids uh, uh, from some of, for some of these products that are out there. So again, you can look at this paper and uh, I'm not gonna talk about it. Take home message very briefly. Uh, if you are looking at nit nitrogen efficiency, uh, this will be nitrogen intake and uh, nitrogen in milk. This is as simple as that. Uh, you will have reduced ammonia losses, reduced nitrous oxide emissions, and that we also showed that uh, with these low protein diets uh, when you are decreasing protein, but of course you have to be aware uh, that you may get uh, a loss of milk production. Um, we also have shown that um, particularly for low protein diets, histidine is, is an important amino acid and maybe in fact uh, the first limiting amino acid uh, when it comes to uh, milk production, both milk production and milk uh, protein synthesis. Well, that's all I had. Um, I'm just gonna show here Chang He <laughs> that you, you just saw talking here, he started that work at Penn State, uh, Fabio is here, and then Susanna. Those are the three uh, uh, graduate students who uh, did the history in the work at Penn State. Okay, thank you.